Today we're in the garage to replace the four wear item serpentine belt pulleys in addition to the two belts that are on the 3.6 e-torque in my 21 Wrangler Rubicon. Now I'm not having any issues out of it. You know it's common for dirt to get up in the engine bay and get into the bearings of the pulleys and they start squealing and everything. I'm not having that issue. I did have it once and I think it might have been isolated. Uh, it went away. And I have inspected the belts. The belts actually look really good. I don't even see any cracks in it at 101,000 miles. So I do think they use quality materials in those belts. There's no fraying. I don't know, it looks good. But I do plan on getting remote and it's over 100,000 miles. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and replace those. I did try to find videos. I didn't see any other video. So I thought, well, I'll go ahead and make one. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and get started. First thing you want to do is remove the negative battery terminal. And I'm going to put it inside something to keep it from touching and grounding out. The next step is to take out the air box and the intake tube. So We'll start here, it's a 10 millimeter. This one is 10 millimeter. Let me get my drill out. Now I need to change it out for an eight millimeter for these hose clamps. And instead of unplugging this intake air temperature sensor, uh, I'm just gonna lay it all to the side and see the wire over here. I'm just gonna lay it over like that. And then this one. All right, after that, you're gonna to wanna to disconnect this right here. You just push and pull, and everything should come out once the bolts are completely removed. All right, let's take this out. All right, that's up. That should allow this section to come this direction. Let's get a little twisting motion. Just a little bit in the way. There we go. And again, I'm just going to lay it over here. And this box, once you unbolt here, just give it a good strong tug and it'll pop out of these rubber things down there. And that's done. Now, I was told by a dealership mechanic that works on these things all the time that uh, it's a good idea to go ahead, even though it doesn't call for it in the service manual to remove the radiator fan. So I'm gonna take his word for it. It'll give us more room in front. So the first thing you wanna do is remove these four push pins right here. All right, so I just got the first one out. Just wanted to give you a quick tip. These are in here pretty good. So if you're trying to reuse these push pins, um, I didn't tear it up, but it's it's a little worse for wear uh, i would work your way around trying to save it and change the direction that you're pulling on it that way you don't rip it in half i got it out and i didn't break anything uh, but what i did do was i would get up under it this yellow one like that and just give it a little tug create a little bit of slack and then i had to go back to this one like that and then get this one up under it to give it more of a fulcrum next you need to remove this upper fan mounting bolt that is eight millimeter on the driver's side now you need to remove the radiator fan connector just push in right here and pull now we are removing the fan mounting bolt on the other side and that's going to be eight millimeter as well okay so we're close to removing the radiator fan but we've got a wire loom retaining pin here that we need to get out 
Okay, so I've run into just a little bit of a hitch, it looks like. It wants me to remove the fan in the service manual, but they've got this pathway here that they molded into the fan that would keep me from lifting up and out. You see how it's catching there? So the only thing I can think of, hoping this is soft aluminum, is just tweak this just a little. Hold this here so you're not moving this joint much any more than you have to that should be enough and it felt really soft so hopefully uh, it's very forgiving everything still feels tight so if you don't want to remove the fan um, decide for yourself I'm gonna go ahead and remove it but if you don't feel comfortable with that you can do this without removing the fan. This is just to give you more room to work with. All right. Well, make sure you don't damage anything. Get caught on something. This, uh, this tab over here. Okay, so I'll tell you what I ran into. I did get the fan out without damaging anything. Starting from the position where you just took the bolts out, this is right underneath this radiator hose. So what you'll do is you'll scoot it over from the driver's side to the passenger side to get this tab to clear the radiator hose. So once it's clear enough, you're going to still be touching it, but you won't be putting too much force on this plastic. I needed to bend the lines out away from the fan shroud just a little bit more. So towards the passenger side get this to clear the radiator hose get it up and out and then lift up i am going to trim a little bit off to make installation and removal for the future a little easier i can kind of tell where there's some rubbing marks right there due to vibration what i'm going to do is still provide support to the line but i'm just going to take about that much off Okay, so now that I have the fan out, I can better see things. The accessory drive belt, that's the narrower belt. The engineers hate us. It goes all the way around the lower radiator hose. So I would recommend going ahead and doing your system flush right now because you're gonna lose most of it right there. Since I've got the fan out, I thought it'd be a good Time to take the opportunity and use compressed air to spray the air from the backside of the radiator to try to clean any dirt out that I can't get. I do go to car washes and from a distance I do try to spray and clean it out the best I can. Um, and including from the engine bay side, um, obviously not getting too close to where I damaged the fins and everything. But here's the pile of dirt that I got out of it. It's most of the dirt, not all of it. Uh, so it's pretty considerable. So yeah, you might want to do that. So since we've got to drain the radiator, we need access to the radiator drain petcock. So you've got to remove the front bumper skid plate to get there. The front bumper skid plate comes off with seven 13 millimeter bolts. All right. And the drain petcock is right there. You'll rotate it counterclockwise. I, I tried to use my hand to turn the petcock, but I guess I can't get up in there enough to get enough leverage to turn it. It's not super tight, it's just tight enough. So here's the combination, these pliers here, to get the angles that I needed to turn it where I got it, which is just over halfway. So we're near the end of the coolant flowing out. I just want to let you know that the drain petcock starts at a horizontal position. You need to rotate it counterclockwise. And when it reaches horizontal again, about the halfway point, just go a little bit past that and you should start getting good flow. For the larger diameter hose, that's the lower radiator hose, I ordered this off Amazon. 
It's made by ToolWiz. You can see the shape here. This is a hose clamp plier. It's a specialty tool. And just used a, an old set of robo grips for the smaller diameter coolant hose down there to get the clamp. Just a little tip. If you can, mine was oriented like this, and I really needed it down here, so I got enough of a grip to let the tension off of the hose to rotate the clamp. Then I was able to close it up and then just slide it back up the hose so I could just pull the hose off. So the smaller hose came off pretty easy and the lower one was a little stubborn. It's stuck a little bit and it's got a ridge right here that retains it. What I did was I had this pick and I put it up under the edge of the hose Try not to point at the middle, I don't want to scar it up, but just work my way around the diameter. And once I kind of broke that loose, I started tugging as best as I could this direction. And uh, also using my left hand to pull on the hose at the same time. I eventually got it off. Now you're going to need a breaker bar. It's half inch drive, half inch drive extension. It clears and a five millimeter Allen wrench. So now you'll put your extension into the motor generator mechanical tensioner. You're going to rotate it counterclockwise towards the passenger side to take the tension off the belt. We're trying to take the belt off. And when you get it over here, you're going to need to take the 5 millimeter Allen wrench and look at this picture here. You're going to put it in that hole right there to hold the adjustment so you can take the belt off. Okay, so I've got a shorter 6 inch extension to put right here in the hydraulic tensioner. And as I pull this back with the breaker bar, we'll be able to pull the main drive serpentine belt off this idler pulley that's right next to the hydraulic tensioner pulley. Alright, now we need to Pull towards the passenger side. You can see the pulley moving there. And we're going to get it off the idler. And because I've already tried this, we're going to have to take it off the tensioner too if we get it past the groove. So you've got to hold it and get it off the pulley at the same time. Easier said than done. Let's grab that pick. Hopefully it goes back on easier. There you go. Today the parts we are replacing is the hydraulic tensioner pulley, the idler pulley, and the mechanical belt tensioner pulley. These are all for the main drive belt, which is this. And then behind the main drive belt is the accessory belt. Here is the accessory belt tensioner. That's going to be on the lower driver's side of the block. And here is the accessory belt. So we're going to start on this first since it's at the back. Now I'm going to remove the hydraulic tensioner pulley with this setup here. I'm using a half inch drive just because it's longer and I'll have more leverage. There's an adapter here to 3 8 drive T50 star socket. Right there in the center of the screen is the accessory drive belt tensioner and it is held on by three bolts. Now we're going to take our half inch drive breaker bar, our half inch drive to three eighths drive adapter and our 10 inch long three eighths drive extension. Put it in the accessory drive belt tensioner. You'll see the uh, three eighths drive spot that you put it, little square spot. You'll put it in there and you'll rotate it towards the driver's side to take the tension off of the belt so that you can take the belt off. Stick your hand in there. And then take the belt off. Now we're going to take the accessory drive belt tensioner off using a 13 millimeter 3 8 drive socket and a 3 8 drive ratchet. There's one bolt here, one there, 
and one up top. Okay, so on the accessory drive belt tensioner, I had to use my calibrated elbow instead of the torque wrench because I could not fit it up in there. Maybe you'll have better luck. If you do, it's going to be 37 foot-pounds. Um, if not, then just try to remember how tight it was and account a little bit for breakaway torque, which means it's a little uh, harder right there at the beginning. Uh, and, and come in just a little bit under what you felt when you took it off. Now we need to remove the vacuum pump. So you'll disconnect the vacuum line here. This connector. And I'm going to leave it on the bracket. So I'm going to take these two bolts out. One right here. And one at the back on the other side. Now we need to open this door on the side of the MGU. And there's a nut in there that we need to take off. And we also need to disconnect this connector. Another white clip we need to pull up here. Right there. Let's see if it pulls right out. Yeah, I didn't have to use a, a pick in there. Now we need to remove this cable from the MGU. I'm going to get over here and push it to the side, just like that. We're almost ready to take the MGU out. Let's uh, get this bracket off. That's 13 millimeter as well. And after I got the bracket off, I like to put the bolt back in place just so I don't lose it. Disconnect these hose retainer clips. And I'm gonna go ahead and get this wiring harness clip right here that is on the motor generator unit. Now we need to remove the hose clamp from the line coming out of the bottom of the motor generator unit. And just slide that down so that we can pull the hose off. And then up top, you'll find another one. Look at the top of the screen. There's another one right here. Once again, I'm using a pick just to try to get this hose to release. After they sit there a while, they kind of stick. I'm just kind of working my way around. To get the motor generator unit off, you'll need a half inch drive ratchet. 6 inch half inch drive extension and I'm using a deep well 15 millimeter socket. So it looks like there are three bolts holding it on, actually a bolt down here next to the water pump and then one nut here and one nut here. Now it will be sliding off of some I don't know about three inch studs it's a good thing I took the electric fan out. The top two nuts and the bottom bolt is a little snug, so I'm going to break them loose first with a half inch drive breaker bar, six inch long, half inch drive extension, and a 15 millimeter deep well half inch drive socket. All right, now we are ready to take the motor generator unit out. It's going to slide off these studs here towards the front. Make sure you don't hit your radiator. A little heavy. Not that bad. Alright. You gotta get this belt off. Alright. Now I can lift it out. Don't hit the radiator. Ugh. Now just take out your serpentine belts. I just want to point something out real quick. It's important because it looks like this idler pulley is offset just a little bit. And I was looking for marks and I found a bunch of dots on the edge right here. And there's a little symbol. Can't make out what it is. But everything goes back together like this. With the engine block behind it, the timing cover. 
I've never used a 16 millimeter socket before in my life, but there you go. Here's a 16 millimeter for you, and you need to torque this to 41 foot pounds. And your hydraulic tensioner pulley, you'll need to get your T50 back out and torque that to 41 foot pounds as well. Now it's time to go ahead and put the new accessory drive serpentine belt on. After you get it past the coolant outlets here, go ahead and slip those back in place. Just to get them out of the way. Just slide on easy. And as far as the routing of the belt, it goes around the crank here, goes underneath the coolant hose here, around the tensioner pulley, up and around the AC compressor. And when I take the tensioner and move it to the driver's side, at the same time, I'll slip it up underneath the water pump pulley right here. Okay, so even though I was looking for this rounded edge to be able to slide it up on there, it wasn't working. So let's try this again. All right, that's the way. Tensioner pulley last. Now let's reconnect these coolant hoses. And I'm going to position these tabs to where I can get to it in case I ever need to do this again. Now we need to remove the mechanical tensioner assembly from the back of the motor generator unit. This is a 15 millimeter socket. And guess what this one is? Yep, 41 foot pounds. All right, so now we are ready to slip the motor generator unit back into place. Let's make sure like this bracket and everything's out of the way. Flip it back onto the studs and slide it all the way on. We're going to put that belt on there. There you go. That looks safe. All right. Since we've slipped the MGU into place, just hanging off the studs a little bit. It's a little tight front to back. So I'm going to make sure that I can get this belt on um, by going ahead and slipping this on the grooved serpentine pulley on the back of the MGU. And go ahead and slide this thing the rest of the way in place. Now you need to tighten these 15 millimeter nuts on the top and this bolt that is just left of the water pump to 46 foot pounds. Let's put the main drive belt back on. So I've decided to use a ratchet. I couldn't get the breaker bar in the position I wanted. I wanted it over here more. Um, so I'm using the jack handle that I've got slipped over this half inch drive ratchet and of course the six inch half inch drive extension. And here's the belt routing diagram. You're going to wrap it around everything except the idler pulley and as we pull it over here towards the passenger side we're going to slip it over the idler If you swapped out the MGU mechanical tensioner pulley assembly, then you will need to remove the pin that came in the new one. So again, we're going to put an extension in there, turn it to the side and just reach in there with some straight pliers and pull the pin out. Next, go ahead and reconnect your coolant hose to the MGU down here at the bottom and the one at the top.
Now we just need to push this pin in right here to retain the hose. Now you're going to need a 13 millimeter or half inch socket to put this bolt or this bracket here back in. And you're going to torque that to 80 inch pounds. All right, time to reconnect all of the electrical going to the motor generator unit. There's not a lot of slack in this cable, so it might be a little difficult. There are alignment tabs to get this thing in there right. Let's give it a firm push all the way on. Now I'll take the nut that you took off before and you're going to torque that with a 13 millimeter or half inch socket to 15 foot pounds. And by the way, that would be 180 inch pounds. That's not what you want. Back it back off. The reason why that was wrong is as you approach it, You want a nice smooth movement and then it clicks. You see where I stopped and then started back up and it clicked immediately. I just happened to be right there, but I don't know if it's accurate. That's how you want it. Now we're gonna reconnect this connector here. Again, you've got a white tab that after you get it in place, Make it click, and then push the white tab back in so it locks in place. And don't forget, you've got a little push pin down here in a bracket that the push pin goes into. Mine's a little boogered up, but I think it'll hold. There you go. Yeah, that looks good. It's not going anywhere. And uh, don't forget your dust cap here. You can see it's got a rubber O-ring seal, so it's important to keep moisture out of there to prevent corrosion. You get a nice little snap out of that, letting you know that it's closed up. All right, let's go on to the next step. Now it's time to reinstall the vacuum pump. The vacuum pump bolts are torqued to 17 foot pounds or 204 inch pounds. By the way, that is a 13 millimeter or half inch socket. Reconnect your vacuum line, push it on all the way, lock the clip in place, and reinstall your electrical connector here till it clicks. Now it's time to reinstall your radiator fan. Be careful not to damage the fins on your radiator. This might be a little tricky. I did do some trimming on the plastic, like I mentioned earlier, to try to make it easier to drop down in there. Make sure everything's out of the way on both sides. Okay, real quick, just to give you a point of reference to let you know if you have the radiator fan shroud completely seated, you can see the top of the radiator and the fan shroud. It's even on both sides. That lets you know that you've got those tabs, there's locating tabs, one on the passenger side and one on the same spot on the driver's side. It's just kind of a, a cupped area. Now you need an eight millimeter socket for the radiator fan assembly bolts. There's one here and one on the driver's side that you removed earlier. Now I tried to find a torque spec, I couldn't find it and uh, looked everywhere I knew where to look. <laughs> uh, so what I'm doing based on past experience, I'm tightening just enough till I feel the bolt head make contact and just giving it just a little bit more, seeing that's about, about an eighth of a turn and uh, that's as far as I'm going. Now we are ready to reconnect the electrical connector.
and we can't leave this loose so you see this groove right here on this side of the connection you'll line that up so you can see it this long piece of plastic this slides up into it so get it towards this end and then slide and now it's secure all right so now we need to reconnect this push pin here there's a hole right there push it back in and on the air deflector on top of the radiator don't forget to slide this thing under before you push the push pins back in now it's time to reinstall your air cleaner box don't forget to check and make sure that your rubber feet are slid all the way up on these pins and these feet will just snap in place just like that to reinstall your air inlet tube let's start on this end first leaving the air box loose so it wiggles a little bit more and gives me more room to work with there you go uh, make sure you pay attention to this alignment tab right here it should fit inside the notch that's on the air box here the throttle body again make sure the bottom actually starts all right it got that started first push that way All right, so now your clamps, your hose clamps, will be tightened to 35 inch pounds using an eight millimeter socket. Take a 10 millimeter socket and install the two bolts here, holding the air inlet tube in place onto the fan shroud. And these will be torqued to 27 inch pounds and install the air cleaner retention bolt and torque it to 44 inch pounds. Reconnect your makeup air hose. Let's push it on until it clicks. Now it's time to reconnect the negative battery cable. Push it down, make sure it's engaged well, and you'll tighten this with a 10 millimeter socket to 53 inch pounds. Get a 13 millimeter socket and set your torque wrench to 18 foot pounds to install your bumper skid plate. Now it's time to start adding coolant. I have taken a paint pen and for ease in the future I've marked that this is the MGU. This is the hybrid battery. I don't need to top this off because that system is still full i didn't have to disconnect anything and that's your engine coolant right there so how this process is going to go since we don't have the machines that they use at the dealership we're going to fill it up we're going to fill it up to the max mark and then you're going to see bubbles kind of come out keep filling it up until it stays stable around the max and minimum level and the same with the mgu after that, I would feel comfortable enough to go ahead and start it briefly and see where the levels settle out. And we'll add coolant to the MGU reservoir. Now here's a tip to get the cap off. Just rotate it and there's a slot right here. I don't know if you can make it out but you'll line it up. It only goes one way, so I'll have to go back around. And now you'll see light through there. Put the flat tip screwdriver in there and rotate. Oh, 
on this one we're just going to fill it to the max level and I expect it to do the same thing and you should see air bubbles. For the MGU coolant reservoir we're going to stop at the max line because the entire MGU coolant system capacity if it were completely dry which it's not is 1.9 quarts or 1.8 liters so we don't want to overfill it and have to pull any out. For the engine coolant reservoir, if the block was completely dry, which you're going to have some in the lower block, and the radiator was completely dry, and it's not, and you'll probably have some left in the hoses, but if everything was dry, the whole engine coolant system capacity is 11.2 quarts or 10.6 liters. Now, before we actually fire the engine, what I want to do to try to get some of the air pockets out and get the fluid levels to stabilize is I'm going to let it crank without the cylinders firing. So how you do that is you'll put your left foot on the brake pedal, right foot on the gas pedal all the way to the floor, push the start button, remove your feet, let it crank about five or six seconds, and then push the button again. After cranking the engine five to six seconds, I did notice that the MGU coolant reservoir level did drop a little bit, in addition to the engine coolant reservoir, but it was a little bit less. Most of our movement is gonna be after we actually idle the engine up to operating temperature. You'll see the temperature start to level out and make sure that your heater is fully on. That way you can get the air out of the heater core as well. So our next step is just idling, and then once that level stops changing so much and I can keep it in this level, at least you can see some in the bottom up to the max line somewhere in there, then I'll feel comfortable with actually driving it down the road. Make sure you take some coolant with you. And you may want to carry around that flat tip screwdriver just in case you have to add to the MGU coolant reservoir. And of course, I want to point out that these are pressurized systems, so make sure you let it set a couple of hours before you actually try to open it. You don't want anything spraying you in the face. Before you add, make sure it's cooled down some and nothing will come out. You're basically just making sure that the reservoirs have visible levels of coolant in them so they don't start sucking air back in. Okay, so I feel good about the levels as they are right now. I'm going to start it for the first time. And then I'm going to change the menu to vehicle information and change it to the coolant temp so I can watch it and keep a close eye on it. And I need to turn my heater on. So we'll just slide them all the way up. Okay, so seeing as we ran the engine less than a minute and I already have coolant down towards the bottom of the tank, I know that I can safely remove the cap here because it's not hot and go ahead and top it off again to the max line and try again. As far as the MGU coolant reservoir, it's stable so far at the max line. So let's start it up again. We're currently at 156 degrees, and I'm just going to give it a few revs to help push some of those air pockets out. That was about 3,500. We'll do one more. And let any potential hot spots cool back down. And I'll do this again after the thermostat opens up and the temperature stabilizes. Before the thermostat has opened and after revving it a few times like you just saw, I can see that the level has dropped just a little bit below max, but we're still safe. I'm going to keep an eye on it, wait for the thermostat to open and go back in, rev it a few more times to try to get those air pockets out. And then I think about that time, Hopefully, if I don't have to add any more, then we'll be ready to take it down the road. We're talking a really small system here, so it's not really surprising 
The level hasn't really moved on the MGU coolant reservoir, so that's good. It's been about seven minutes and it looks like the coolant temperature has stabilized to about 188 degrees. I do feel heat coming out the vents, so I know the heater is fully open and the thermostat is open. So at this time, I'm going to give it a few revs again. Just trying to get those air pockets that may be there out. Now let's go back outside and check the levels again. So after that runtime, I do see that the MGU coolant reservoir just needs a little bit added. Uh, it's down by the minimum line. And it looks like we're down below the minimum line on the engine coolant reservoir. So it's good to see because we know that air pockets are coming out. I'm going to wait for it to cool uh, to be safe because that thing is pressurized right now and you don't want fluid coming back out at you. It's a slow process, but we want to be safe. So up to this point, we've filled the reservoirs. We've idled the engine up to operating temperature which looked like at the time it was 188, it's at 190 now, just sitting here idling. And I have the heater at its highest temperature setting. You don't have to have the blower on, but just set it to its highest temperature setting. And after observing the levels, I feel like they've stabilized enough to where it's safe to take it around the neighborhood and maybe just outside the neighborhood to get some RPMs up to try to get rid of the remaining air pockets that may exist. And then of course, I'll bring it back home let it cool down. I'll open the engine coolant reservoir, check the MGU coolant reservoir, and add coolant as needed. But I feel like we'll probably just need to add little bits for the next couple of days, but it'll be in safe levels. After my short trip of about six miles and letting the engine cool down overnight, my engine coolant level is about a half inch below the party line. And the MGU reservoir stayed above the minimum line. With that, and knowing you're safe to drive with some extra coolant handy just in case, the minimum and maximum lines on all of your coolant reservoirs can only be measured accurately when the engine has fully cooled down. For example, at the end of your workday or after sitting overnight. So just keep topping it off until the level stops dropping. As to how much coolant you'll likely need, I'll round up to the nearest gallon of what I used and put it on the end screen. Go for it. The local dealership wanted $482 in labor and $390 in parts to do this job, so there's money to be saved there. If you found the video helpful, please leave a like and share it with other 3.6 eTorque owners so they can save some money too. Y'all have a great one. Thanks for watching and I'll see you later.